And he did. Yes. Before I begin my message today, I have a little brief video I want to show you. Uh, somebody sent this to me this week. It was a statement by Dr. Uh, James Dobson. Many familiar with Dobson and the family ministries he had for years. And even though retired, he still carries on a lot of great deal of ministry. This was a statement he made following the Supreme Court decision that came out last month. And I thought it was an excellent, excellent way to put things. Sometimes I believe that uh, we need to hear from other voices and other mouths as well as to what what's happening in our culture around us, because sometimes Brother Joe just says it, you don't always believe it. <laughs> but trust me, this is a good word. If you want to enroll that, that video for me, I think you'll, you'll agree with what he has to say, but also the doors that are opening along with this Supreme Court decision we need to be fully aware of. Amen. everyone, I'm James Dobson and this is Family Talk. I have something very important to say to you today. As most Americans and indeed the watching world have heard, the United States Supreme Court decreed on June 26, 2015 that marriage in this country would thereafter be redefined. More than 5,000 years ago in Genesis 2:24, we're told that the Creator gave Adam and Eve his prescription for the first family. It's written, For this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. That was the divine plan, and it has essentially prevailed wherever mankind has taken root from that time to this. Now, however, Five imperious lawyers, known as justices, have a better idea. Instead of marriage consisting exclusively of a man and a woman, they expanded the definition in the Constitution to include same-sex unions. And that's only the beginning. Already there is speculation about other permutations being added, including polygamy and what is known as polyamorous relationships, and that means many loves. Even though I have anticipated this cultural sea change for the past 30 years, I've found myself grieving over the implications for our country and for Western civilization. This, this decision will quickly touch every dimension of American life, and the family will be forever changed. I grieve most for what it will do to our children, our grandchildren, and future generations. They will be taught that right is wrong, and that wrong is right, and that the teachings of Scripture are unreliable and inaccurate. How outrageous it is to me that boys and girls barely out of babyhood are already being introduced in some schools and some states to perverse adult behavior. Soon, public school textbooks throughout the country will be rewritten and re-illustrated to conform to this ruling. It matters not that these revisions will contradict the beliefs and the convictions of their parents. It's already become the law of the land. Many adopted kids will grow up in homes with same-sex parents lacking either masculine or feminine role models. They're among the saddest victims of this ruling. Adults will suffer too. Every indication is that a barrage of court cases has been planned and will quickly be filed against those who hold to politically incorrect views of marriage. Many of us will be dragged into court to be prosecuted or subjected to civil judgments. Some will lose their jobs. Some will lose their professional licenses. Some will be persecuted and ridiculed and fined. Some may go to prison as the years unfold. Since same-sex marriage has now been determined to be a universal human right by the highest court in the land, 
It will trump religious liberty and affect churches, seminaries, ministries, Christian schools, businesses, uh, hospitals, charities, and many other institutions. The tax-exempt status of each of these entities is at serious risk. Above all else, I fear that God's judgment will befall this once great nation. Senior pastor Robert Jeffress told his congregation at First Baptist Church, the Supreme Court's gay ruling is an affront in the face of Almighty God. I feel that way too because the scripture makes that clear. He said the Supreme Court has declared open season on Christians who oppose same-sex marriage. The past 17 presidents of the Southern Baptist Convention who are living today have all condemned the redefinition of marriage. They represent more than 40 million members and 39,000 churches. Chief Justice of Alabama Supreme Court, Judge Roy Moore, a friend of mine, said, welcome to the new world. It's just changed for you Christians. You are going to be persecuted. Conservative Justice of the Supreme Court, Samuel Alito, wrote, I assume that those who cling to old beliefs, traditional Christian concepts, will be able to whisper their thoughts in the recesses of their homes. But if they repeat those views in public, they will risk being labeled as bigots and treated such by government, employers, and schools. That's one of the other justices of the Supreme Court. The National Organization for Marriage issued this statement on the day the Supreme Court decision was issued. They wrote, we reject this decision and so will the American people. It represents nothing but judicial activism, legislating from the bench with a bare majority of the justices on the Supreme Court exercising raw political power to impose their own preferences on marriage when they have no constitutional authority to do so. It is a lawless ruling that contravenes the decisions of over 50 million voters and their elected representatives. It's a decision that's reminiscent of other illegitimate court rulings such as Dred Scott and Roe v. Wade, and it will further plunge the Supreme Court into public disrepute. Make no mistake about it, they wrote. The National Organization for Marriage, or NAM, and countless millions of Americans do not accept this ruling. Instead, we will work at every turn to reverse it. The U.S. Supreme Court does not have the authority to redefine something it didn't create. Marriage was created long before the United States and our Constitution came into existence. Our Constitution says nothing about marriage. The majority who issued today's ruling, today being June 26, have simply made it up out of thin air with no constitutional authority. In his letter from a Birmingham jail, Dr. Martin Luther King discussed the moral importance of disobeying unjust laws, which we submit applies equally to unjust Supreme Court decisions. Dr. King evoked the teaching of St. Thomas Aquinas that an unjust law or decision is one that is, quote, a human law that's not rooted in eternal law or natural law. Today's decision of the Supreme Court lacks both constitutional and moral authority. There is no eternal or natural law that allows for marriage to be redefined. Today's decision is by no means the final word concerning the definition of marriage. Indeed, it's only the beginning of the next phase in this struggle. 
Nam is committed to reversing this ruling long over and uh, long term and ameliorating it over the short term. We as fa at Family Talk concur that with that entire statement. I'll end my comments by quoting the final words from the Manhattan Declaration written by the late Charles Colson, a mentor to me, and Professor Robbie George, a great friend, and Dr. Timothy George. These brilliant men wrote, because we honor justice and the common good, we will not comply with any edict that purports to compel our institutions to participate in abortions, embryo destructive research, assisted suicide, and euthanasia, or any other anti-life act, nor will we bend to the rule Amen. purporting to force us to bless immoral sexual partnerships, treat them as marriage or the equivalent, or refrain from proclaiming the truth as we know it about morality and immorality and marriage and the family. Listen to this very carefully. We will fully and ungrudgingly render to Caesar what is Caesar's, but under no circumstances will we render to Caesar what is God's. It's time for Christians to awaken and allow its collective voices to be heard. We must defend their beliefs in a spirit of Christian love, but with conviction that the Christian and religious liberties handed down to them and us by the Founding Fathers must not be relegated to the ash heap of history. Amen. You know, we're living in a culture that uh, if you're probably younger than uh, 40, 30, then probably some of these cultural shifts and changes are not as shocking to you as they are to somebody that's older than that. Uh, in a day, in an, in, an, in an age, in a generation where not just homosexuality, but all immorality is widely accepted. It's widely received by the culture as commonplace and as norm in the culture that we live in uh, amongst a younger generation. But no matter what generation feels what way about whatever it is, the final word on all things we believe comes from Scripture. I still believe that the Word of God is the final word. I believe it is the truth. I believe it's very clear instruction from God. Who in, in it is God is revealed to us and his will is revealed to us. I am a firm believer. You might call it old fashioned. You might call it strict religious. I don't care what you call it. I love Jesus. All right. I do. I'm unashamed of that. I love Jesus. He changed my life. I've never been the same since he laid his hand on me. And uh, I believe with all my heart what the scripture teaches. There will not be a day when Pastor Joe Arms will arise and conduct any same sex marriage. It's just not going to happen. And as long as I pastor this great church, Believers Fellowship, it will not happen in this building. It's just not going to happen. Why? Because the Bible makes it very clear what, the, what God's will is and what God's standards are, no matter what happens. Now, if you're as old as dirt like myself, you know, you're probably, uh, you're probably uh, looking at this whole thing and saying, how in the world did we ever get to this place? How in the world have we come to this place that's, that we are this nation in crisis? One statement that Dr. Dobson made was that it was in regard to the wrath of God being over our nation, avoiding that day. I believe if we study scripture, we'll, we'll begin to di discover that we are a nation that's already beginning to experience the wrath of God, or at least the doors are wide open for the wrath of God. I'm going to just go to the Bible today because that's the best place we can go to see how we've gotten here. And we've come a long way. I mean, there was a lawsuits now following this Supreme Court decision that are springing up everywhere, all over the nation, as fast as they can be filed by a radical homosexual agenda. Lawsuits against Zondervan, which is a Bible publisher. The lawsuit is suing Zondervan for having printing Bibles that have statements that are contrary to the homosexual agenda and homosexual lifestyle. 
And since they're an offense and affront to the homosexual community, they want those Bibles to stop being printed or at least to be revised to a more modern mindset. So there's a lawsuit there. There are lawsuits now in Oregon and other places that are imposing and at least getting to seek to get the government to uh, uh, restrict or withdraw all tax exempt status from Christian organizations who will not agree to the Supreme Court's law uh, uh, you know, situation. But not only that, there's now also a, a group that's seeking to uh, get insurance companies to remove the liability and the insurance from all religious institutions who won't agree to the Supreme Court ruling. So it's one thing after another. It, it's like dominoes. I remember preaching a sermon years ago. Uh, it was is entitled, you know, a, a nation in crisis. And it, it had to do with Exodus where Moses stands in the gate of the camp. Remember Moses has been on the mountain. He's been praying, interceding on behalf of the people because God's judgment's getting ready to fall. He now comes down, stands in the midst of the camp and calls the people to make a decision. If you're for God, it's time to stand for God. If you're, not, if you're not for God, but he calls all those who are willing to follow God and God's word and will to come forward. All those who don't experience the wrath of God. I mean, thousands of people, tens of thousands that day lost their life. I think the same kind of decree needs to go out to our nation today. But that if you follow Israel's history or America's history or Rome's history, you'll always see that it's like dominoes to destruction. It's, it's like the first domino is set in place and, and the next one, the next one, the next one. And when the first one tilts and falls, hits the next one, they all begin to collapse. The first domino in most every situation for a collapsing nation, and listen carefully, even a collapsing home always begins with leadership. When leadership fails, Mark it down through history, read it through the Bible, read it through historians, wherever you get your information, you'll see the same thing takes place. When men refuse integrity, when men refuse character, all right, it begins to collapse. When that collapse, the next domino to fall is moral purity and morality becomes tainted and begins to deteriorate and destruction begins to come. And it's just one after the other. Well, in Romans chapter one, You'll see a passage here in Romans chapter one, which gives a very clear uh, insight into what happens when a person or a culture or a nation, whatever it might be, begins to reject integrity, the truth that flows from the word of God. All right. When they reject that principle. Remember the book of Romans, the thesis of the whole book is, is, is simple. It's just God. All right. It's all about God and who God is. And, and one of my favorite verses in all the Bibles found in Romans chapter one, we'll be reading from in just a moment. And it's verse 16, which says, you know, uh, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to all those who believe. It, it's this open door invitation to anybody who wants to avoid judgment and wrath and hell and, and certainty of life to come in and to be saved, to find rescue, to find deliverance. It, it's the gospel. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of that message which offers hope to all humanity, to anybody that will come to God and in faith follow him as their God and their king and their Lord and their savior. There's hope. Now, two verses later, there's this other clear picture that begins to develop about God's wrath. Well, here we have this first of all, this picture in Romans one of God's love and the beauty of the gospel message to deliver anyone who will come. But then he moves to the other option. All right. You can choose God's grace so you can choose God's wrath. Now, what makes grace look so good is when you get a picture of the wrath, you know, and the judgment that's out there. Grace begins to look like a great choice in that regard. But let's look how it lays out here in Romans chapter one, verse 18. We'll start with this verse and just go through these verses. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, all right, and unrighteousness of men. The catch is who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Now, first of all, God's wrath is against all sin. Why? Well, God's a holy God. You got to get that in your brain, all right? Can you, can you make room for that? God is a righteous, holy, pure God. And God in his righteousness and his holiness abhors and detests all sin. The problem is we're all sinners, but God loves you and God loves me. So he's made a way to escape the wrath of God. And that's through his son. It's this gospel door that's open. And that gospel door is the Lord Jesus Christ. And you come into him and you run into him and you find salvation. But he said the alternative here is the wrath of God. 
And who's it against? Well, it's kind of like the first domino. It's, it's men who have no biblical integrity, men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. The word here, some, some translations say who, who hold it or some people who say who, who, uh, who hold it back or who detain it. But the idea here is I'm not holding the truth of God's word such as to embrace it, you know, to, to hold it and to stand on it and to declare it. These men, they take the truth of God's word says they suppress it. They don't, they don't want to hear it. They don't want it preached. They don't want it known. They don't want it talked about. They suppress the truth in unrighteousness. In other words, they hinder it. They don't want, they don't want the gospel message. They don't want the gospel truth. It, it, let's make fun of Christians, make fun of the Bible, whatever we can do in the generation we live in, but we're not going to hold to the truth of God's word as the highest of all standards to live our lives by. Now, when we do that, then it leads us to this next part. They also reject the revelation of the knowledge of God, which is the truth, all right? The truth is this revelation of God. Verse 19 says, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God has made it evident to them. For since the creation of this world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature, they've been clearly seen, being understood through what was, has been made so that they are without excuse. Here's what the Lord is saying to us. Here's people who don't want the truth. But here's the problem. They have been exposed to the truth two ways. Every man that's ever been born, every woman that's ever been born has been exposed to the truth in two ways. That's why I always people tell me, how can you believe that God would send everybody to hell? I said, well, God doesn't send everybody to hell. You know, people choose to go to hell because they reject the grace of God. But what about all those people who never heard the gospel? This passage is, is pretty clear in, in, in making something obvious to us. One, there's not a man who's ever been born, not a person who's ever been brought to life who God has not somehow made himself known to them. Even in John chapter one, the gospel of John says that Jesus Christ is the light that has come into the world and has shown into the hearts of all men. Now, we may not have the gospel revealed to us. We may not have all the truth and that saving grace revealed to us, but everybody has a light that's clicked on by God. It says that one day we're going to be accountable. One day we're going to have to answer. We're not here on our own or by ourselves. But not only that, God has made it clear to everyone within them, but it also says without them. He said by the very creation that surrounds us on every hand, there's a testimony of the reality and the existence of God. Creation itself is a declaration. He says that which is invisible, which is God, is made visible by creation. In other words, the visible shows us there's something else going on here. The detail, the design, the architecture, the uniqueness of creation. It couldn't happen from an explosion. It couldn't happen from all the other mythology that we're exposed to day by day by day. It happened by the power, unique power of God in Genesis 1. The very first thing God does in Genesis 1 is say, hey, I'm God and I made everything. <laughs> in the beginning was God. All right. He made everything. Now, I know that we just spent a billion dollars and many of you are thoroughly enjoying the pictures coming back from Pluto. <laughs> Y'all enjoying the pictures from Pluto. Some of you don't even watch the news. We just spent billions of dollars to send a little space probe up to take pictures of the universe. Why? Every good NASA scientist will use this line. Every good public relations person for NASA will use this line because we just need to discover where we're from. Give me a hundred dollars, I'll show you. I don't need a billion. I don't need five billion. I don't need, hey, I, I'll tell you for free. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Pretty simple. All through scripture, it talks about design and, and, and even on Wednesday night from Proverbs, we've been studying on Proverbs where wisdom cries and talks about how it, God created the earth and laid out the oceans and pulled up the mountains and set forth the springs and all the things that God did. The uniqueness of them. There's no way that every species, every design, every created thing can come from one little atomic explosion somewhere on the planet or out in space and all these things. It just doesn't happen that way. Uh, but men have always thought the same. They don't want to acknowledge God, so we come up with something else. Let me read to you from the book of Job. And, and I just caught this passage this morning, and I, I put it on the screen if I had time. But in Job chapter 12, he's talking about, 
you know, the glory of God and, and how God is obvious. In verse seven, it says, if you're not sure, go ask the beast and let them teach you. And the birds of the heavens, let them tell you. Or speak to the earth and let it teach you. And let the fish of the sea declare to you, who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? He said, even the fish and the birds and the beast are smart enough to know that God created all these things. He said, Brother Joe, you know, you know, you'll be laughed at by scholars. It's all right. They'll be laughed at by God. <laughs> God says he holds them in derision. You know, that he laughs at the foolishness of this, of this world that we live in. And when we stand before God one day, you tell me who's right then. Yeah. I have a feeling that I'm not going to be wrong here. I said, but God's just shown it to him. And but what have they done with these things? They suppress it. They don't want it. They'd rather embrace some other teaching. In, in, in verse uh, 20 says this from the English Standard Version. It says, his invisible attributes, talking about God, namely, even his eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So that everything that's been made is a declaration that there's somebody who made it. There's no design without a designer. And how can this whole system be upheld in what it does without some force, something unique, holding everything together? It requires a designer, it, require, it requires an architect, and that architect is God himself. He said, and those things to sensible men will be understood. But what happens? Why do we not receive the truth? Well, he goes on to say, so I'm glad you asked. The next verse, he talks about the imaginations, which what happens, this, you suppress the truth, you won't acknowledge the truth. So here goes the next domino, common sense, speculations are thrown out the window. In verse 21, it says, for even though they knew God, that's they knew about God, because he's revealed it to himself, they do not honor him as God, nor do they give thanks to him, but they become futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they become fools. In other words, since men refuse to honor God, to accept him and to receive him, they don't honor him. Obviously, then they will not give thanks to him. Futility sets in. Darkness sets in. Deception sets in. Now, here's the problem. You've heard me say it multiple times. The problem with being deceived is you don't know you're deceived. All right. The only thing that opens the eyes. The only thing that brings clarity to the deception is for light to come in. But men would reject the light, John chapter one says, because men love darkness rather than they love light. So they'll just not acknowledge the truth. All right. Since they wouldn't, since they knew about God, they weren't going to honor God and they weren't going to be thankful to God. They become foolish in their mind. In other words, they don't glorify God and they don't give thanks to God, which leads to a, a, a rejection ultimately. They just reject God. The next verse in 23, I don't have it up, says they exchange the glory of the incorruptible God for an image made in the form of corruptible man and birds and four feeted beasts and animals and crawling creatures. So they worship the cre creature and not the creator is what it says. In other words, they exchange the deity and the glory and the majesty of God, to put that off the side and put man there and put the created things there and, and put the creation itself there. So we'll worship and we'll honor this. It's, it's like this. 40s, 30s, 40s, 50s, when evolution began to make its big appearance on the scientific scene and began, men began to accept it more and more. And then ultimately, it, every, now every school teaches the context and the concept of evolution, which basically is Romans chapter one in a nutshell. We reject the divine authority of God over all things. We've come from an explosion, which led to something else, which led to some little, you know, bit of slime floating around in the tar pond, which finally crawled up on the beach and became a, some kind of lizard, which finally grew wings and flew off and later became a man. On and on it goes. What happens? When you choose to reject God, you have to come to something else. How, how do you do that? Well, your foolish mind is darkened. And he calls it the foolish speculations of men. The foolish imaginations of men. Well, this is how it must have been. Based on what? I just think it's that way. It just sounds sensible to me. Professing themselves to be wise, they become fools. 
and reject the obvious truth that has been set before him. In other words, they, they become vain in their imaginations. Their foolish hearts are darkened. They think they're wise, but they're fools. And they change the glory of God. And here's the way it works. And we've, we've talked about this in the past, but I think it's good for repeating it. Once you introduce the, the, the context of evolution and you embrace evolution, then you've opened the door for everything else. He says that here, after evolution, you know, it comes humanism. In other words, we worship the created thing. We worship the creator, more, uh, the created person more than we worship God. We've exchanged God for man. We say, all right, this is what it's really, it's about me. It's about the world. It's about mankind. It's about humanity. And more importantly, it's about myself. You know, if there is no God in heaven, if there is no accountability now to God, because there is no God, so I can live like I want to do, act like I want, treat people the way I want to treat them, do what I want to do with my life, with my body, with my, with my, whatever I want to do, I can do because there's just no God. I don't have to stand before God. So if there's no God, any Thing goes. Now, if anything goes, if you follow this process from evolutionism, this, the whole mindset there and the theory there, then it moves into humanism where we celebrate mankind and it's all about self now and what you want, contrary to what anybody else wants, you know, as long as you're happy. Then it gets into, well, everything else follows paganism and hedonism and all the other things, which we see lay out here. So we reject God. We become foolish in our thoughts. What happens next? And then there comes this condemnation because we've rejected the truth is what happens next. He puts it this way. Therefore, God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity that their bodies might be dishonored among themselves. Now, this has to do with just all kinds of sexual sins, ultimately, that you dishonor your body among yourself. You have to understand that if you study the scriptures carefully, that God did create you. And that you are unique and God has created you for a purpose. And this body of yours is very unique. Prior to the fall, when men, sin, men when Adam sinned against God, prior to the fall, his body was literally the vessel of the presence of God. He lived and in, in, surrounded and enveloped and wrapped in. He had a relationship. He had a walk with God. He knew God. He walked in the garden with God. But when sin entered in, because God is holy, the separation took place. All right. No, God's over here, you're way over here, and there's no way you're going to get to God. It's just not passable by you. Every religion in the world, other than Christianity, if you want to call it a religion, is based upon how do I get from point B over here where I am to back to God? Well, I do works, I cut my hair, I shave my head, you know, I, I fast, I, I, you know, I say my prayers three times a day, whatever it is, I'm going to go through X works and that's going to get me to God. None of them work. Why? Because He's glorious and we're unglorious. Because He's incorruptible and we're corrupted. So there's nothing that can bridge that gap that we can do. But God, this is the gospel message. God sent his son because he loved the world. He gave his only begotten son and he bridged that gap. So if we come through that door, we find salvation. We find deliverance. We find hope. We find deliverance from the wrath that's to come. But we've rejected that. And instead, we've made it all about us. What satisfies me? What makes me happy? What I want to do? It doesn't necessarily mean that I don't acknowledge God because everybody knows, you know, it was have a little spirituality. It's, it's kind of cool to be a little spiritual, you know, to have some kind of faith. But yet we don't let God be God. We don't let Jesus be the Lord of our lives. We're going to do our own thing and somehow tie a cross on it and think that we're sanctifying our ill, our immoral life. Here's what he says in verse 25. They exchange the truth of God for a what? For a lie. And they worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. It's all about man now, not about God. Now, verse 26 is powerful. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. Even though women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. Do I need to do a little expose on what that means? I think we understand what it's talking about. What we're doing with our bodies, where it leads. First of all, it's just all types of immorality. You know, adultery, fornication, premarital sex, all those things. That leads since our mind is darkened, we're not satisfied. We need to try a little something else, a little something new, kind of bring the life back to it. And so we keep going further and further away. And it says in verse 27, not only was it women, it was also men. In the same way, abandoned the natural function of women and they burned in their desires towards one another, men with men, committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to depraved minds. Now there's three times he says here they, that they exchange. One place he says they exchange the, the glory of the incorruptible God for man. 
Right. They want to worship themselves first. And then it says they exchange the truth of God for a lie. I'd rather believe a lie. It's easier to believe. All right. And then it says they exchange their natural function for the opposite sex for inordinate. And it says vile affections is the way King James puts it. Inordinate affections. Three times they exchange. But it also says three times and God gave them over. In other words, you're going to go that route. You can go that route. You can make that choice and you can make that decision because if you're going to have an experience, a real change in your life, if you're going to experience the grace and the glory of God, it's going to be because you're not making those bad exchanges anymore. You're not exchanging the truth. You're not exchanging your natural affections. You're not exchanging, you know, anything for the reality and the truth of the living God. You want a real, genuine relationship and a real, genuine walk with a holy God. So God gives them over. King James Version, that last says, God gives them over to a reprobate mind. Reprobate means something that will not stand the test. You say, what test? The test when we all stand before God. There's going to be a test? Yeah, it's pretty simple. You love Jesus or not? Not did you say it, but did you do it? Did you love the Lord? Did you follow Christ? Where's Jesus? What did you do with Christ? What did you do with the Lord? Now, this leads us to the, the indication. This is the last part of this, you know, uh, of what, this, what he's saying here. The indication of our failure. How, how do we know that we're falling here? Because this is the fruit of everything we've done. We're filled with all unrighteousness. Let's see if this doesn't describe the Western culture specifically. Wickedness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, gossips. Let me stop right there. All right. Some of you are really railing on the homosexual over here. But he says also the greedy the envious, the murderous, the argumentative, the deceitful, the malicious, the gospel. In verse 31, the slanderers, even the haters of God, the insolent, the arrogant, the boastful, and the inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they know the law, the word, the ordinances of God, it says, they'd rather practice the other things that are worthy of death. Because this, they not only do the same, they give hearty approval to those who practice them. Boy, this is exactly where we're at. I am so sick and tired of turning on the local news at night and seeing one news story after another news story embracing and telling us how wonderful it is and how courageous it is with all these homosexual marriages. I wouldn't even watch, I like to watch the ESPYs, you know, when they hand out the big sports awards. I wouldn't watch the ESPYs because they were given Bruce Jenner the Courageous Award. You know? I don't think anything courageous about that. You know, you, you give some courageous awards. Give them out to our military. Let's give those some courageous awards, awards. Amen? Don't give them to some guy who's confused about who he is and what he is. When God clearly made him a certain way, let him know what he was. It's a pretty clear sign when you're born of what you are. But we reject that because I want this. Now, I know the argument. Well, Brother Joe, you know, there's just, there just seems to be some kind of compelling evidence, which there is none. We went back and saw those stories about the scientists who had this compelling evidence about genetic trait towards homosexuality and realized that that study was done by homosexuals and it was skewed and they lied on me in the results. That's another story. But let me, let's just say we agree with them. I was born this way. Let me tell you what, I was born every wicked way too. We're all born with propensity to sin, to cheat, to lie, to steal, to murder, to kill, to practice immoral sex acts. We're all born that way. And what we're dealing with here is, 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 is it's not like we're, you know, well, you know, Brother Joe, I'm a homosexual, so I'm in that same kind of category with, with, with minority groups. If I was a minority group, and I'm fast become one as a Christian, all right, <laughs> I'd be screaming. What are you talking about? This is, we're not talking about what you are, we're talking about your behavior. Like, can you imagine the stupidity if, if I got up and said, listen, I've had enough of it. You guys, I want you to know I'm a chocolate cake eater. <laughs> and if you're not a chocolate cake eater, then you need to eat some chocolate cake so you'll understand me. In fact, I went into the store the other day and they didn't have any chocolate cake, so I'm suing. Them. In fact, I came across a bakery the other day that didn't make chocolate cakes at all. I'm suing. Them. In fact, you ought to have chocolate cake this week or I'm suing you. 
That's the stupidity. As, as ignorant and as stupid, that's the stupidity of it. You know? And therefore, every violation of everything that we stand for, even as a nation constitutionally, has been thrown out the window. Now, if we choose to go this route, then how many Christians, how many people are, not just Christians, every other religious faith that embraces that, that millennium old 5,000 year tradition in Genesis is as a man and a woman, they shall become one. Becomes under the gun and under the assault. We wrap it up by saying this. First Corinthians, it says this verse, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Don't have those foolish speculations. Neither sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. What's he saying? If you follow the whole context of 1 Corinthians, he's saying, he says it in just a couple chapters, if any man's in Christ, he's a new creation. If you really are a believer, that's not what you are anymore. Your behavior changes because your belief changes. You can always tell what a person's believes by what their behavior is. All right? Am I really believing God or not? All right? Am I really honoring God? You say, well, I honor God, but you don't do what God says. You don't respect his word. You don't trust in what he's done. Then we don't honor God and we're not thankful. Our lack of gratitude is an expression of our unbelief because we're not really believing God. He said, all this, all this is just, and I, when he goes on later, he says, and the rest of it says, and such were some of you. He said, this is the lifestyle we all used to live. That's what we used to be. He said, but when we come unto Christ and we surrender our hearts and lives to Jesus and we accept the forgiveness of all our sin and all that bad behavior and of what we are and the offense we've been to God's holiness, God washes us and he forgives us and he saves us. Which goes back to verse 16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. That's where cleansing comes. That's where salvation comes. That's where deliverance comes. That's the message of the church. That's the message today in the church. If you're here today, say, well, I'm a practicing homosexual. Well, listen, I used to be a practicing sinner too. All right? But I got saved. And therefore, my behavior has changed. You say, are you perfect? No. Every day is a challenge. Every day there's something I'm having to go to the Lord and say, I blew that. But I'm not what I used to be. I'm not what I'm going to be. But praise God, I'm not what I used to be. And there are things that change in your life when Christ really gets a hold of you. And if you're still embracing your old lifestyle, you need to pay attention to what this scripture says. Don't fool yourself. Don't fool yourself. But that's what happens. We get in our sin and we kind of come up with these self diagnoses Well, I guess I'm not too bad. You know, I mean, look at everybody else. I'm not as bad as so-and-so. And, you know, everybody, yeah, everybody's doing it. Everybody's getting high. Everybody's doing this. Everybody's getting drunk. Everybody, I mean, look at the TV show. You think that half America's homosexual. You know, or more. It doesn't matter what everyone does. Don't become futile in your speculations and your imaginations. Believe the truth. Receive the truth. And our church door is open to anyone who wants to believe the truth. We're open to any person in any sin to come in and hear the truth and be set free in and through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. The Bible makes it clear that when sin abounds, grace much more abounds. Well, this is the grace place. This is where no matter where you've been, what you've done, how you've lived, can all be washed and cleansed and God make a new person out of you. This is the grace place. It's not the judgment place. Judgment, according to these passages, has already been passed. We stand under the umbrella of judgment or the umbrella of, of, of freedom. Who put us under the judgment? We did. All right. We chose a way. How do we get over here? We choose the Lord Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, at verse 20 says, but they're without excuse. You know what that really says to me? Nobody's going to be able to point some finger at God and say, I didn't know. Nobody told me. Right? And God says, you're without excuse. It's been clearly made, but you wanted to believe a lie more than you want to believe the truth. But there is a power that's greater than the power of any sin in our life. If we're serious. It's greater than any chain that holds our life, any bondage that captures our hearts. There's a greater power. It's called the power of the gospel. And you need, to, you need to understand this. It hasn't got anything to do with how I feel. It has everything to do with what's been said. 
And all that faith is, is saying, I'll choose to live this. And as much as I know how, and as much as I possibly can, by the grace of God, I'm going to live this kind of life and walk with Christ. Enjoy my fellowship with God. Would you stand with your heads bowed this morning?